How so? I don't even know. Like, are we recording? Is this like when? Are we ready to start? Okay, he says we're yeah we're rolling. That would have been good. You're gonna cry. Maybe start that way. I yeah, might cry. You might cry. <laughs> that's how we that's how we <laughs> open. Yeah. Well, the other day, some I, might, of the, I think we were talking about Valentine's Day. I thought we would cut that out. It was like, was no, that was in there. Was, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, oh, crap. Did I make fun of Rachel's shirt or something? Are people going to think I'm a jerk? So, anyway. Ted is not a jerk. Okay. All right. Here we are, Bible reading plan recap week, whatever. I don't, I lose Yeah, man, we're numbers. in the thick of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, we've, in, we've in the middle of the book. We're halfway through halfway the second through book, the, which is. It's been, I mean, I'm, the more I do it, it's not easy every day. It's not easy every week, but I'm getting more and more excited the more we do this because I love it. And I love uh, the structure. I don't know who put this plan together. I do. It was Lance and it's so well done. I really, really think that I love that we did Luke and then Acts and I love the Psalms he put in. So I'm just really pumped about it right now. I have found myself a few times appreciating the like the beginning and the end of the weeks and like what was covered. And so I I am grateful for the work you put Mm -hmm. into. Well, it wasn't just me. There were several of us working on it. Thank you. I'm so grateful. All right, all right. So I know we got some questions. Yeah, we did this last week from some of the previous uh, episodes and, and reading week. So let's jump in with some of those. I know. I do not have them in front of me, so I'm going to trust you guys. Uh, I have, we got them. Uh, yeah, we have some of them. So uh, let's and, start out with— But let's let's remind folks, we're recording a couple of weeks ahead. Yes. Yeah. And so we're covering questions that you recently asked based on where you were. And it, sorry, we don't mean to like delay the answers, yeah. but that's the way this is working. Yeah, that's the way it's working. And also, it's it's sort of a good reminder that this is all connected. Yep. Yeah. This is one big, long story, Absolutely. and there's nothing that happened in Luke that's not relevant now. Yep. So it's okay. Yep. Okay, so here's our first question. Um, I've been wondering about the times when Jesus is alone. Who's accounting for those moments in the Bible? Like when he's by himself, being tempted by the devil in the desert, or when he's praying when his disciples are sleeping? Does he come back and tell the disciples? How do we really know what happened there? You look at me like I know that answer, bro. (laughs) What do you think, Ted? What the heck? You want to jump in there? I mean, yeah. Are you saying like, okay, here's like if if I had to guess. If you're a small group and somebody asks you that, what's your answer? I'd be like, oh, I'm going to have to get back to you on that <laughs> No, I'll probably make something up. Like, uh, let, me, let me think about it for a second. I would probably say, like, if we don't, like, know explicitly, like, oh, well, we didn't need to know that, like, what's here is what was supposed to be there. But there probably was some, like, the moments where he was in the desert with the devil, like, he probably told people about that yeah. story or that experience. And yeah. so people are writing that, but mm-hmm. we're not recording the conversation. They didn't record the conversation maybe that they had. They're just retelling it. Right. I don't know how that works. I, I mean, I think you just said that the two things that are really important there, A, is that he was, Jesus was telling them what happened. Because remember, they're his disciples, which means they're his followers. Yeah. They're learning from him, right? He's their teacher. So he's explaining all of these things to him. And then also remember whenever he commissions his disciples, he said the Holy Spirit is going to remind you of all the things I told you. Uh, And so there is also this, you know, like you said, like it's here because it's supposed to be here. There is this this human part of it. They're retelling these stories. I mean, even Luke, it's on a firsthand account. He's saying these are their stories that happened. Um, But also it's God, you know, over the whole process, bringing to us what we need to remember. Yeah. These gospels weren't written in one sitting. And so it took a long time to compile all these things and remember the stories and order them. I think of the book of Matthew, especially Matthew's my favorite gospel. I don't, it just the way it's structured and all that, but Matthew retells the story of Israel through the life of Jesus. And so he's like, you know, Jesus, uh, as a, a young child, it, it fleed to Egypt and then comes back through the waters uh, or he comes back and then goes through the waters like the uh, Israelites did and spends 40 days out in the wilderness like they spent 40 years. And he he soaked in all those details from the, the life of Jesus and, and Jesus teaching him for those years and recorded them in a way that was retelling the story of Israel through the life of Jesus. So I think Jesus told him, yeah. this is what happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is how it's connected to the bigger picture. Because we also read at the beginning of, or the end of Luke on the road to Emmaus and then beginning of Acts, that what Jesus did after his resurrection was open their minds. Yeah. Mm-hmm to the scriptures yep. and how he fulfilled all that. So yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, he did teach them. All right, question one, I think we got that. Got it. All right. Was, was, was some of these other ones? Oh, sorry. Do you have the oh yeah, I got, I got it pulled up. All right, uh, let's see. Um, 
So we had from our small group various levels of concern and questions about Judas. Oh, okay. Mm. So Luke 22 verse 3, it says Satan entered Judas is where the conversation started. And so was Judas an awful person already? And Satan took that opportunity. Uh, seems to know, or Jesus seems to know Judas was going to betray him according to the book of John. Did Satan just ask to sift Judas and God said, fine, go for it. So what, what's going on there? With- okay. Well, I think that they're already asking all the right questions. Was because um, this is this can feel complicated. I think that we can talk. We could talk about this for a whole podcast. We will not. But there's there's one aspect of this, which is when we hear Satan entered Judas. I think we think like horror movie type. He was possessed and like Satan was controlling his every movement. Right. That's that's not how the Bible talks about this spiritual realm. I think that's hard for us to understand as modern people with like a modern idea of spirituality and we, we tend to be more materialistic and intellectual, but the spiritual realm is real, right? It's real now, it's always been real. And uh, we were created to engage, yeah. engage spiritually just as well as in the world, right? In the very beginning, we were created to be in this intimate relationship with God whenever he was our authority, whenever we were submitting to his will. But in the very, in the garden, in the fall, there was this accuser, this, this opposing negative force, the devil, who tempted Adam and Eve, and yet they were still responsible for their sin. But this spiritual realm's always been a part of the biblical story, and I think it's just hard for us to get. So that's the first part of, of, of this answer. The second part is, is, I think she said, was he always bad? Um, a little bit. I mean, you have clues in before in the Gospels of whenever you do sort sort of see Judas's character. So um, in John 12, it's this really beautiful story of Mary anointing Jesus with this really expensive perfume, right? And she's anointing him as the king with this really, really precious perfume. And it says, Judas, Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples— who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cares for the poor, but because he was a thief and he was in charge of the money bag. He used to help himself to what was put into it. So we already see that, G- that Judas really isn't walking in the light. He's already showing deceit. He's already yeah. showing his greed, that he cares more about money than he does the kingdom and what Jesus is doing and who he is. So... I think that we have to hold both of those things together. So Judas already was showing who he was. He had the, the front seat to the reality of Jesus, to his truth, to his character, to his light, to what he was doing in the world. And he still was seeking after money and being dishonest. And so when, when it says Satan enters into him, he, was, he had opened himself up to that, just like Adam and Eve opened themselves up to the power of Satan. You know, we are, there's no neutral for humanity. We are spiritual creatures and we are designed to live in this kingdom. And we're either for the kingdom of God or we're opposed to the kingdom of God. And so he is responsible for that. It was his choice and God allowed it to happen. Yeah, I I think of Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. In the story of the Exodus where it says that God hardened his heart. But if you really dig into what that means, it's that God just allowed him to be turned over to what was already there. And if anything, just allowed it to be accelerated. He didn't put that into his, he didn't put a hardness into his heart. He just uh, allowed allowed it to continue happening. Right. So this isn't a situation where, you know, God, the the puppet master, Mm -hmm. allows, you know, Judas to beyond any of his right. will or control to right. execute these things mm-hmm. because this is what had to happen. Yeah. This was part of... And Satan plan. wasn't con- completely controlling him either, right? Yeah. This was his decision to give himself over to the darkness. Yeah. And also, like, so God wasn't controlling him in that moment. This was his choice to turn from God to rebel. But God's sovereignty, he used this for his purposes of salvation, yeah. which is really the amazing part of this. And you see it happen throughout all of scripture, even in Acts, even in this week, you see what was bad become a good thing for the gospel. I think we got that one good. Are there any other questions? Yeah, there's one more. One more? Uno mas. All right. This is a big one. You ready, Ted? (laughs) All right. So it says, in our small group, we dove down the rabbit hole of Luke 23, um, 43, saying, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So this is from the scene where Jesus is 
on the cross. He, he's between two thieves. Yep. One is mocking him and the other defends him. And so I'll just read that real quick. And it says that uh, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justify, justly, sorry, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he turned to Jesus and said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. So the small group is talking about that moment. And then one of the ladies asks, wait, I thought that Jesus went to hell for three days. How could this man end up in paradise the same day? And so then it just started a conversation about what happened between the death of Jesus and his resurrection on the third day. Did he go to hell? I mean, that's... It, what what's that all about? Yeah, you think like the movie posters, like Jesus went down there and like def, you know cut Satan's head oh, off yeah, or right. something. You know, he like defeated yeah. Satan or I don't know. It's yeah, not how it and works. we and and it's 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 been said in in the creeds. You know, he descended yeah. into hell. So I actually brought the yeah. Apostles' Creed printed out here, and so uh, the Apostles' Creed. I think I should have looked this up. I think it's like three hundred ish. It is. That's right. Yeah. Right. Council of Milan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So wait, just just so for the AD. average person here, like a creed is what? Like in it's old- it's a statement of faith that the church proclaims together. We're all coming under this statement of faith. This so is what we believe. So three hundred A.D. Church together is like, hey, we're going to write this thing. We're going to all say this together, uh-huh. and it's going to be all something that we. Yeah. Okay. Because in the in the the decades and centuries after Jesus, they're trying to understand what really happened. Yeah. And it takes a long time for this to coalesce, right? So, the Apostles' Creed is this: I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. And then it keeps going. But that that line, he descended into hell, like this is early church doctrine yeah. in a sense. And so uh, it makes sense that we would have these questions because Jesus says one thing, like you'll be with me today in paradise. And it's, it's, what's paradise interesting- Paradise is not hell. Paradise is not hell. And the same word that's used to paradise, uh, the, the Greek word there, in the Old Testament translation uh, in Greek, that's the same word for Eden. So uh, you, you think about just as a paradigm, as a framework for heaven, where God is. Anyway, uh, so did, did Jesus go to hell? Well, we would say we don't believe that he did that. We don't believe that he went into hell because we believe his words here. But uh, if I were going to point someone to another place, it'd be Hebrews chapter 10, which I think might be becoming m- maybe my favorite chapter in the Bible. Whoa. I know, man. Whoa. Hebrews Dude. ten, like I don't know. It's it's you so committing good. to like I, that. I said. I, I said know. might be, might be, okay might be after a long time. Well. Said Colossians one. Hebrews ten is getting there too, man. Uh, so I'm going to go Hebrews ten. First of all, it starts out talking about how uh, Christ was a sacrifice, and it makes this crazy claim about the way things were before Jesus, and it says that the the blood of bulls and goats could never take away our sin. And you're like, wait, what were they even doing back in the Old Testament? Mm -hmm. Uh, But then it says this, every priest stands daily, I'm in verse 11, at at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he then sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So it's like Jesus was the substitutionary sacrifice right then and there. And then he sat down at the right hand of the Father. And the reason I would go there is because this discussion comes from the early church fathers trying to figure out what Jesus accomplished. And there was some belief that he did go to hell and he did preach the gospel to all those who lived before him that could never believe in him because they didn't know who he was. And that that was argued against and pointed out that he didn't need to do that because as Hebrew says, he, he offered a sacrifice for all time. And if you look up uh, before that, Psalm 40 is quoted. And basically what the author of Hebrews is saying is that what God cares about aren't our sacrifices or the way we've done things before. He, he cares about a faithful heart and a faithful life. So if, if people that came before Jesus had faithful hearts and faithful lives, then his sacrifice is applied to them. And so there's a mystery there that it's hard to understand, but that's how I would answer that. No, we don't believe Jesus went to hell. 
even on the Apostles' Creed. Even in the Apostles' Creed that we've read before. Yeah. And there are some updated versions of mm-hmm. that, that that don't include he descended well, into I think hell. just like a little cultural context too. Um, oftentimes we translate Hades for hell for Hades. Yeah. And Hades really is just the place where people who died went to wait. Yeah. So we think hell where you're being punished, where, you know, that's your eternal place of judgment. Yeah. And for, in Jesus's time, Hades was really just the place of the dead until they're awaiting, awaiting the final judgment. And so when, when we say hell means something different. So to say he descended into Hades means he was in the place of, you know, which is a little bit different yeah. too. But also we have a song that we wrote at Clear Creek uh, Community Church, our, our arts team. I shouldn't say we, I had nothing yeah. to do with that. <laughs> Lance did the Bible plan <laughs> and wrote this song. No. Yeah. Uh, it's called All Praise to Jesus Christ. And we were singing the gospel story, and it says he conquered hell and sin and death, which might make you think, oh, he went to hell and conquered it. Well, no, that's not what we're saying. He conquered uh, um, the need for hell yeah. for those who are saved, and so uh, and and sin and death and all that. Yeah. But. That's a much better answer than I would have given okay. in my small group. All right. All so right. keep sending your questions. Yeah, in. we yeah. we want to interact in this way. Yeah. The email address one more time. Clear Creek Resources at clearcreek.org. Boom. Boom. There you go. All right. Well, let's jump in. Uh, that took, how long we spent on that? A little bit of time. There you go. That was good. About 10 minutes or so. All right. So Acts chapter 10 is where we started this week, right? Yep. Yes. <sighs> this is a big one. Yeah. Why is it a big one? Because it's a it's a whole new revelation really that's surprising and i think for us it's it's hard to grasp how surprising and important this section of scripture is and it's what a lot of the conversations in the new testament letters are about so we have to really understand this understand a lot of what the letters when we start to get there this year are really talking about yeah why don't you want to give a quick summary of what happens there in 10 yeah, the point of fingers. Yeah, we're pointing <laughs> fingers at each other. <laughs> no, you do it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so in chapter 10, it starts out with Peter. Uh, it says that he has a vision. So he's he's on a rooftop and he's praying. And there are other times throughout scripture where people are praying intently and he's experiencing the presence of the Holy Spirit and he sees uh, a sheet descend from heaven. And inside this sheet are all sorts of animals that in the Old Testament are considered unclean. And it, it also pointed out that he was hungry at, at the time, which I think is interesting. So he's, uh, he's hungry and uh, he hears the voice of God saying, what does it say? Uh, kill and eat, mm-hmm. right? Um, so he, he then kind of argues back with this voice from the Lord. No it's means, like, yeah, Lord. there's no way. I've always followed the... He's uh, like, don't tempt me. Yeah, don't tempt me. I don't eat unclean things, yeah. which we can talk about uh, the difference between clean and unclean and holy and common, all that stuff. But... Well, just right quickly, yeah. you brought the, the difference is that has to do with Old Testament stuff. That's There's right. Things that uh, Jewish uh, leaders, they would say like, hey, eat this, don't eat that. This is clean, not clean. That's right. So there, there were Kinda. things that would make a person That's right. unclean. And so, you know, they, they didn't eat pork, for yeah. example. And um, that's why the story of the prodigal son is so scandalous because he was with pigs and serving pigs and feeding pigs. So uh, that was just one of many types of food and animals that, that Jewish people did not eat. And Peter is hearing the voice of God saying, there aren't unclean things anymore. And Peter is shocked by that. And it was shocking because it was different than the rest of the world. So there, it was not only food, but it was all these other ritualistic laws that they had to set them apart. You yeah. are to be a, a separate people from all of the world around you. They're doing all these things that you're not allowed to do because they're pagans and they're worshiping idols and they're unholy. You're to be holy and set apart. And here's all the ways you do that, which included all these food laws. Yeah, and just we get in our minds that that the opposite of holy is unholy, but biblically speaking, the opposite of holy or the counterpart to holy is common, which is what he's he's talking about here. Like, uh, I've never eaten a common thing. It would make me unclean. And there's a whole lot of Old Testament stuff there, but... Yeah, we're like, common, that's like McDonald's. What's right, right. Common? yeah. No, but but I'm holy is something that's been set apart, consecrated for use in the Lord's service or in the Lord's presence. Which and includes his people. That's right. Yep. So, 
This is a turning point in this in the narrative of salvation, where it's not just a people who are living a certain way that might be set apart, but God is saying He's the one who makes people go from unclean to clean, from common to holy, and that's through His. And He's declared it. That's right. Through His Son. Yep. Well, and I think when I used to read this chapter in the Bible, I used to think it was really, it really was talking about okay, so these food laws are now obsolete. This is a part of what he's saying, but it's not really the point. The point is about these people. Because as soon as this vision happens, these Gentiles show up at his door and say, God sent us to you. And Peter knows exactly what that means. I did it when I'm reading it because I'm so outside of this cultural context. It doesn't mean anything to me. Okay, good. Eat it, Peter. Go, go, go. You know, but, but God's really saying, hey, these Gentiles, they're not unclean. I've declared them clean. Tell them the gospel. I mean, it's really this amazing moment of this salvation. They knew it was for the Gentiles. They've always known that, but they didn't really understand the the grace and the really bringing in of people, not through becoming Jews, but just because I've declared them to be my people through Christ. Yeah, I think one of the things I got hung up on here a little bit was just that phrase: "What God has made, what God has made clean, do not call common." And so, is that the idea that like? What God, who God has uh, redeemed, or you know, people who have come to faith, do not call common. Or is this like saying, like, no, all people ever, like He's created everybody, don't call. It's, it's not all people. Yeah, that's it's, a great question. Yeah. It, it, what you see, kind of unravel in the story, is that the the Jewish people come speak with Peter, and they're like, "Dude, you hung out with uncircumcised people. You ate with them. That." in our world makes you unclean. And Peter's like, no, 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 a new thing is happening here that they're part of. So he's saying like, hey, the the, the Gentiles that the, the God has made clean don't call common. That's right. Because they are holy. They So it's not as a broad statement here. Where it's not about all this. humanity. Yeah. Yeah. It's about the Gentiles and anyone who would uh, believe in Jesus and receive yeah. the Spirit. Because that's what he goes on to say. Mm-hmm. He's like, wow, the Holy Spirit is in them. He can tell. He can yeah. see. And he's like, why would we not baptize these people? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this Gentile was was seeking after God. I mean, Luke makes very clear this was someone who was trying to follow God, who was seeking after God, who was devout. And he said, hey, go find Peter because he's going to tell you. It says in the next time he repeats this story, he's going to tell you something that leads you to salvation, which is the gospel. And yeah. so the, he, he was seeking after God. It wasn't just anybody. It was those who want to be saved. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, just, I guess, a quick read. At the end, the, the, the people end up showing up. He preaches, basically, a little mm-hmm. bit. They they hear the good news, as they say there, and then they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and he's basically like, dude, we got to baptize these jokers. Yeah. It's like a second Pentecost. Yeah. It's really, it's really a beautiful, beautiful moment, because we had the Pentecost, remember, the Spirit descended upon. Remember, at Pentecost, like Lance said, was this was this festival where Jewish people from all over yeah. came to celebrate together. So whenever the Holy Spirit was upon them, that was mostly Jewish people. And this is another, this is, again, the Holy Spirit coming down, but it's on the Gentiles. And Peter's like, oh my. Yeah. This is real and they're not circumcised and they don't follow all of our our rituals for holiness, but God is still saving them and, and giving them the power of the Holy Spirit. And this was, so this was, the Cornelius, mm-hmm. his whole house. Yep. Mm-hmm. There was a bunch of people there. And then Peter leaves to go back and like tell everybody what happened. Yep. That's that, that gets us into 11. So I think before you start talking, if yeah. whenever we teach how to study the Bible, because <laughs> I want you to go, whenever we teach how to study the Bible, if if there's any story, like like we we're just saying, like whatever's in the Bible is there for a specific reason. You know, Jesus did so many things. We, we, could, we couldn't even, yeah. you know, fill all the books in the world with what he did and said. Um, so if it's in here, it's important. If a story is in here twice, right in a yeah. row, yeah. it's really important. This is a huge thing. Pay attention. Yeah. Yeah. B- because much of what happens the rest of the time it is a consequence of this. Mm-hmm. The, you, I mean, you're going to read. We're going to read the New Testament letters where they're arguing about circumcision or food or who they're Works with. Of the law. Yeah, all these things. And so, again, like we said earlier, the decades after Jesus, they're trying to sort out who who's in, how are they in, how do they live, what do they need to do differently. All that is at play right now. 
Yeah, this was a weird one for me. This day, I didn't have like any notes from it. I just read it. I don't think anything was on like, eleven. Eleven. Yeah. So maybe did I miss story. something again? Well, I it's a re- it's a repeat of the same yeah. story. So uh, yeah. what Rachel's saying matters. But then also in verse nineteen, it's worth pointing out uh, that those who who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. So remember uh, when. After Pentecost, they were all staying in Jerusalem and sharing their lives together, and that was happening. And it makes you wonder, how long would they have stayed? Would they have taken the message out if not for the persecution they began to experience? And when Stephen was killed, they scattered. Yeah. They, and so now you see the evidence of that scattering. People are going to these places far away, and they've taken the message of Jesus with them. The Holy Spirit is with them. And so this is now the spread of the church. Mm-hmm. I mean, when I was reading through this, I was trying to think like, because it really is hard for us to grasp the enormity Mm -hmm. of what God is saying to Peter in this moment and what Peter's trying to tell to his Jewish people. Because remember, they've been waiting for this Messiah, but it was a Jewish Messiah. They were confused when he wasn't just a political king. We talked about that a lot in Luke, but he's still the Jewish Messiah who's supposed to rescue the Jewish people. And they've always welcomed in outsiders. There are always those who, who became followers of God, but they had to become Israelites. They had to be circumcised. They had to follow the laws. And so this would really be like, if we were, this is not a political statement, but if you're like, hey, so like if you want to become American, okay, but you have to apply. You've got to take tests. You've got to work here for a while and get your visa. Then you have to get a social security card. You got to pay taxes. You have to do all these things. And then you're an American. This would be like if somebody was like, well, I mean, you know, if you pledge your allegiance to America, you say the pledge, the flag, you're in, you're American. I mean, can you imagine how upset people would be, right? That's the kind of emotional confusion yeah. that they had whenever Peter said, no, they are now in our family. Yeah. They are part of the people of God. I mean, it was a huge change in how they had to think about their identity. It's part of that upside down kingdom. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, and what you see as you keep reading through Acts is that there are some Jewish people who, once they recognize, oh, okay, that's what's happening here, they're all in. But then you have all these other Jewish people who don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They're continuing in the Jewish faith, and they're the ones that are pushing against this. They're the ones that are causing problems at every synagogue that mm-hmm. Paul and Barnabas go to in all these places. All right, I'm going to try and keep, oh, yeah, us, keep, keep us going. Us, keep, keep us going here. So... Some other stuff that happens. We get into 12. Peter and Herod. Yeah, Peter, Herod. James is, James is, is killed. killed. Yep. And present. I think the one thing that day, just the idea is this was another one of those immediately at the end of uh, 12 there, where uh, in the death of Herod part, what is this? Gosh. Mm-hmm. I say this every time, like my eyes. I feel like I should bring one of those, like magnifying. <laughs> we need glasses. to get you some so glasses have, or some glasses. That, that, that is the truth. You need I, to get you a large print Bible. Dude, <laughs> no, I, it's funny. I I have glasses I'm supposed to wear, but they changed my prescription one time, and like I couldn't see. It was a uh, long story short. I don't wear them when I'm supposed to, and it's bad because I should wear glasses. You should, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it says, immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God glory and he was eaten by worms and uh, breathed his last. This is another yeah. one of those like, oh man, this is crazy. God's, you know, people being like just struck yeah. down and enough that like eaten like his, the worms eating his body. Was that because like it was over a long time or is that like immediately worms appeared and started eating his body? I don't know. I'm not saying yeah. that's a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one yeah. of those, like, yeah, that's yeah, where yeah. I started it going. Seems like, oh, it's a gosh, very extreme, though, crazy. right? It's yeah. just a really extreme yeah. description of, like, he's gone. Yeah. Like, he was the one, like, claiming to be the king. Yep. This is the clash of the kingdoms. This is, oh, okay, this is who is, is stylizing himself as the king of the, really the king of the Jews. And even people are calling him God himself. There's all these stories in history books about how he would put, uh, like, jewels on his robe so he would actually look like he was shining. Oh. And... And God, you know, there's there's this political, again, this political thing going on too. Who is the king? It says in the chapter before that, that they started, this is when they first started calling them Christians. For us, that just sounds like, oh, you're Christians. Are you a Christian? I'm a Christian. Christian is a, it's a, politi- it's a Christ means anointed one, anointed king. So they were calling them the anointed king followers yeah. is yeah. really what Christians meant. And so Herod was a, Opposed to them, right? Because now we're gain, he's they're gaining a following, and so this is that's what this whole chapter is about. And then you see that God says, "No, 
judgment's coming for you if you claim. Yeah, and if you track the story of Herod, he's playing both sides, mm-hmm. the, the Jewish side, because he is part Jewish, and the Roman side, because he has to uh, interface with the Roman government. And so he knows better than to let people call him a god. Yeah, that's crazy. So Herod's out, and then it said right after that, but the word of God increased and multiplied. Yeah. So mm-hmm. like that just like, you know, things are, things are happening. It's on fire. This is where we move into 13. Okay, 13. First, yeah. first section, Barnabas and Saul are sent off. It's easy to read those verses and miss the, the gravity of what's said right here because we don't, like you're, you're reading these names. Barnabas was there. Simeon, who was also called Niger. You, you, if you have a study Bible, you read in the notes there, that, that word means a black person. Like you have mm. someone from Africa, right? Yeah. And then you have Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene is the capital of uh, Libya the, on the northern coast of Africa. So you have two people from Africa that have the Holy Spirit that are prophets. Yeah. This right is, here. Right here. This is crazy. And then you have Manian, a lifelong friend of who? Herod. Herod, yeah. He, who we just read mm-hmm. was eaten by worms and struck down by an... Like, you have a, a mixed collection of people, Jewish, African, uh, rebellious, and they've all been changed by Jesus and given the Holy Spirit, and now they're, they're prophets in the church, and then they're going to send Barnabas and Saul. Like, that's what's happening. How beautiful. Yeah. Everybody's being sent out. It's spreading. It's spreading. It's, like I said, it's, it's spreading, it's spreading it's, to all people. Yeah. To the ends of the earth. Which may, I mean, it's just interesting just in that time, like uh, the contextually, like the movement of people, even back then. I mean, because this is, we have some context, I guess, uh, of timeline, like how far past we yeah. are here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and what what uh, this doesn't account for how many years yeah. in each mm-hmm. place. So when it says that he, uh, when when Saul, Paul, went to Tarsus because he was being hunted, he stayed there for nine years. Yeah. yeah. But So you're just like reading one section to the next and you don't realize nine years elapsed. Right. Well, it sounds that- like... A couple of weeks, and that's yeah. a, that's what I even mean. Like, but in verse, you know, but uh, but the word of God increased and multiplied. I mean, there there's time yeah. in there, and so, but the movement of people that you have a God, they're all in this same place. You have people from, uh, you know, North Africa and all around in this place to even be sent out. It's right. like maybe were they always from there? I don't know, but either way, people were on the move. You 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 know you already see a pattern. Whenever we looked at this beginning of the church, to sort of remind ourselves of what we're supposed to look like, we talked about the marks of the church uh, last week or the week before, and just the, how often it says, and they prayed and they fasted and they prayed and they fasted and they gathered together and they went out. You know, I mean, it's just a reminder to me when I'm reading this of the importance of praying and fasting and praying and fasting and being together before you go. You know, the importance of that in ministry. Yeah, so these are listed as prophets and teachers. They f- filled with the Holy Spirit, leading the church, but yet, what are they doing? They're praying and they're, they're constantly yeah. seeking God. It's not as if like, oh, they have it all figured out and they just know what to do all the time. Mm-hmm. They're depending on God day in, day out. And that's how the church moved forward. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't be any different today. Right. Anything in the rest of 13? Before we hop to 14, I don't know if you had anything in your notes from that. It does. I, I do want to point out that when when Saul and Barnabas go to any new place, where do they go first? You read in verse five. Yeah, synagogue. Where yeah, yes. there you go. It, that's why. Why would they do that? Do you think? So they go to each new town, and they hop into the synagogue. Um, I don't know. I'm just, I'd be making something up. Like, is there an answer? There, yeah, there is an answer. Okay. Yeah, it's because. The story of Jesus is going to gain traction at first with, with the people of Israel that know the history of Israel. And so he shows up in a synagogue and he says, all this stuff that you know and that you're, you're wor- this way of worship, let me tell you what has happened since. Yeah. And so that's how the story of Jesus would gain traction in a community. It doesn't have to, but that's how he would start. It's, it's really, to me, one of the most beautiful things. It's like, even when I was talking before about this is God using things that are bad for his salvific plan for his purposes. I mean, the synagogues were there because when the Jewish people were exiled because of foreign armies, they set up these synagogues all over 
the world because they had to have a place to meet because they no longer had the temple in Jerusalem. So that's why the synagogues were there. And this is the place that Paul goes to to spread the gospel, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. But he always starts in the synagogues. And if they weren't there, he would have just been wherever he was. That's all I had in 13. That's that's good. 14. Um. Yeah, this, I got, I mean, I, I looked it up a little bit in my notes and stuff, but this whole idea of, uh, you know, they, they get there, you know, to the Gentiles, the messages, and then the, the things that they saw, and they think they're like these gods. Yeah. And so they it's have crazy. to be like, oh, no, guys, like, we're, we're just men. But this idea that they tore their garments and rush out to the crowd, I just remember thinking that they're like, I wonder, like, what does that mean? Is that just like... I don't know. You know, like they're like, God, I'm going like to rip their shirt off. Like it was like a power It's like a show or... of grief oh, okay. yeah. for in that time, show of grief to, to rend your garments because they don't want to be worshipped. They're like, don't yeah. worship us. What happened to the last guy that got worshipped and, and, and yeah, yeah, that's true. accepted Two it? Two chapters ago. Right. Yeah, right. The angels yeah, struck him down yeah. and worms yeah. him. Yeah. They want nothing to do with that. Yeah. I mean, I think something just if like 13 and 14 together – the difference between how Paul teaches, how Paul and Barnabas teach the people that they're in front of. And you can see in 13 and before they, like like Lance was saying, they're in the synagogue. So they're teaching these Jewish people, hey, this is David. Like this is the, the son of David who's come, who hasn't been corrupted. They're, they're reminding them of the Jewish story. And this is how it all culminates. Right now, and he does it even, even longer and better in Acts 17 and we'll get there, but he uses this general idea of this creator God. It's a different kind of sermon that he gives to the Greeks in this section. Yeah, that, that and then that's where it gets to right after that, that I uh, spent some time thinking about that it, was, it wasn't the typical gospel message that they've been sharing. At least maybe it was, but what's highlighted here is this idea he's a I don't want to say appealing, but basically like, yeah. dude, he's he's provided for you. He's brought rains that yeah. have brought food. There's one like, God. We're not the, the dead, gods. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There is one creator yeah. God yeah. who created you and who's shown himself to you. It's not yeah. us. It's not all these gods you've been worshiping. There's one God who has revealed himself to you and who has come to save you through Jesus. Yeah. I, I think there's another pattern too. Um, I don't, sorry. Yeah, bring it up, go. Well, just that, I mean, I whenever I was reading through this, I was even thinking about, you know, whenever we we read in Luke how Jesus, you know, he, he came into Jerusalem and they were crying Hosanna and treating him like the king. And then, you know, two chapters later, they're yelling, crucify him. Just the just the fickleness of the people, you know, yeah. how, how easily minds can be turned and passions can be changed. And you really do see this in every chapter in Acts 2. You know, I mean, even in, in this, in 14, it's like, oh, they were so excited. They were worshiping. They were trying to worship them because they were so amazed at the work and the message that they were giving. And then they're in a, the, the Jewish leaders were jealous. And so they turned the leaders to oppose them. And then they st- tried to stone him and kill him. I mean, yeah. I'm like, yeah. this they is didn't the way. They didn't try to stone him. They no, did they stone did. him and they thought he was dead. <laughs> yeah. That's what I was going to say. In, in verse 14, verse 19, but yeah. Jews from Antioch and Iconium, and uh, it came from Antioch and... Is that right? Iconium? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and having persuaded the crowds, it's like the mob bent out. They right. got the mob and then... Well, I mean, they go from worship to stoning pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah, but grab the connection. The Jews from Antioch, the place where people are first known as Christians, so they're already riled up. This movement is happening mm-hmm. and leaving them behind. And they hear Paul is is down the road in another town, so they're going to show up and try and stop him yeah. from letting this go any further. And they throw rocks at him until they think he's dead. I mean, even like when I was reading this, I was even like thinking back to um, our conversation about Judas, just the just the depths of the sin that that hold onto our hearts. I mean, every time it talks about the Jewish leaders trying to turn people against Jesus and his people, it's jealousy. They were jealous and they were afraid for their position. You know, there's we didn't even talk about there was a a magician who opposed Paul, and it was because of his position. He wanted his power in that mm. community. It's always about grasping for money or power or whatever it is, which is relatable today. Yeah, And it's something we have to take care of and confess and be in community with. Or even the status quo. It's like, I don't want things to change. And so I'm going to hold on to this campaign right. because this is how it's always been. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right, guys, 
I think we're we're we're, we're getting there. So yep. then we, we we jump into the psalm. Psalm one hundred was 100. our last reading of the week. Yep. And we talked about before we began recording that we would just read this as our prayer. Yeah. Because this is really see, I was worried about crying. I'm not going to. Um, the, I, I, again, I think this section of scripture is hard for us to really grasp the 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 momentous proclamation that it is, but this is for us, for me at least. I am not culturally Jewish. You know, I would never have been a part of the family of God. I never would have known Jesus and had his spirit within me and been a part of his kingdom, if not for this, the fact that it really is for all people, for all nations, uh, by grace. I don't have to become a cultural Jew to be a part of his family. I mean, that's incredible and a really new thing right here that we all live into now. And so this Psalm um, is a celebration of that to me. It's such a perfect way to sort of wrap up this section of scripture. So funny, y'all. I think we should just read it as a prayer. Yep. Yeah. It's an amen and hallelujah for me. So who do you, do you want to No, you read it, Rachel. <laughs> okay. A Psalm for giving thanks. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Amen. 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 Well, guys, thanks for being here again. Just a word of encouragement to all of you guys out there watching, listening. Just keep it up. We got a little bit ways to go to get rid of this this bookmark. To get rid of the bookmark and get a new one. one. To get a new one, yeah. So keep it up and stick with it. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's Bible Reading Recap. We hope these conversations are helpful as we all seek Jesus and His Word. Listen, if you go to clearcreekresources.org, we have a lot more resources dedicated to helping you study the Bible. Because when we open the Bible, God opens His mouth. Let's continue to seek God in Scripture together. We'll see you next week.